that you can hear me. Ah, so, looking at the resurrection. Going to open in prayer. Oh, good evening, Beryl. I got, a, I got a hello from you. Or a good evening. So we're going to open in prayer quickly. Loving God, thank you for all your good gifts to us. We pray that you'd open our minds and our hearts, that we might grow in our understanding of you this day and always. Amen. Ah. Okay, so um, so we're looking at the resurrection. Uh, and I've got some notes there, um, and you may or may not have them. But I actually want to start with, uh, the if, if you do have the notes, second page, almost down the bottom. Um, and you, if you've got the notes, there's four boxes. Uh, and essentially the question I'm asking you is to have a think about where on the scale uh, of historicity would you place the event of the resurrection? Um, so, so uh, you know, if you could shoot back in time, could you record it uh, on, a, on a mobile phone? Um, <laughs> or, or is it symbolic, perhaps, or spiritual? I'm, I don't like using the word symbolic, partially because in people's minds, it... Symbolic tends to mean uh, maybe not real or, or not important. Um, and that's just not the case. Often, often a symbol is more important than, than the, the thing that it just points to. So now, one of the things that's perhaps worth thinking about is, is if you would suggest that uh, that the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, is a spiritual ex event. It's expressed in historical language, but it isn't an actual historical event. One of the things that works out of that view is that it tends to be, um, that that view is relativized out of usefulness. Uh, and it doesn't actually say anything interesting, does it? It's just like, oh, that's an interesting historic sort of way of thinking about things but it doesn't have any teeth to it um teeth might not be the best choice of words there but i hope you understand you know it, it, it's a kind of thing it might be oh we have an iconic symbolic i feel almost like you've cheated well done um <laughs> uh so but so symbolic you know can tend to be interpreted as toothless on the other end of the spectrum, on the other end of the spectrum, is those people who would argue that it is an indisputable event in history. The, the you know, um, and I can remember getting a little pamphlet, and it had kind of uh, like a timeline and a cross, and they were suggesting that in all of time revolved around the cross, and that's why the years were sort of started there. Now. <clears throat> Of course, that's actually not the case because our calendar starts with what people thought was the uh, um, the birth of Christ. They were out by a few years, but they took a solid crack at it. But that was the birth of Christ, not the death of Christ. Um, but uh, for some people, the the if this is in a sense, if you will, the indisputable moment in history, well, then the challenge. To the modern audience, uh, who who quite naturally, with with kind of the the scientific worldview, have a suspicion of the supernatural. Um, uh, hey, Chris, you're also on the barrel. Lovely. Um, it, it is to to suggest that this is some sort of odd, uh, um, sort of odd pre-rational belief of Christians. So that's the, in, in one sense, is the spectrum that's provided to us. Uh, and I'm not telling you what the answer is. 
uh, I suppose the first thing is to to ask you to have a think about where you go. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, so that's the first thing. Now, I want to read to you. I want to read to you from Mark's Gospel. Uh, and the reason I chose Mark's Gospel for this question is historically, it in the form that we have it, it has three endings. Um, and two of the en endings refer to explicit moments in the resurrection. Um, and the shortest ending, and scholars argue about which is the correct ending, which is the ending Mark intended, uh, which ending fits with his theology, because of course that's an important question to look at. Um, so I want to read it to you, um, especially now that we're just after Christmas. Yeah, not Christmas, Easter. You'd think I would know the difference by now. Oh, I'm picking up from Mark 16. So remember, Jesus we crucified in the tomb. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, that's where the the most certain ending for Mark is. Everything after that in Mark's Gospel, if you have, have Mark's Gospel with you perhaps, uh, is less certain. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, stuck at home with three kids, I'm allowed to flood my words occasionally. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes. Now, everything after that is less certain and you might notice that although the resurrection is referred to and Mark has referred to the resurrection uh, previously in the in the prophetic words of Christ it's not we don't see Jesus we don't see him raised we don't have this moment of contact with him oh hey hey Tracy my cousin is watching from South Africa Cool. Happy Easter over that side of the world. Um, so anyway, the shorter version of Mark, we don't have a res a, an experience of the risen Christ. Now, a couple of theologians, um, uh, and this isn't in the notes, so uh, Burridge is one that I've read, and I, I think he's brilliant. So let's go with Burridge. Uh, they say that Mark does that really deliberately. Because often people have been misinterpreting the signs from God uh, and they've been interpreting them in the wrong way. And so, oh, hey, Pete and James, awesome to have you watching. So it's from Canberra, South Africa, Maribor. This is cool. Um, one of the weird benefits of the COVID lockdown is we all get to kind of connect in this way. Um, where, where was I before I got distracted by the fact that friends are watching from Canberra and South Africa? Yes, so Burridge says um, that people often misinterpret this. So this is Mark's way of deliberately keeping the theology open so that we are like, structurally forced by the story to go back and think about this uh, more deeply than perhaps we would have. So that's his argument for a, a support of the shortest version. 
of um, Mark's gospel. Now, this in no way uh, puts into question any of the other resurrection scenes in the other gospels or anything like that. This is just Mark's. Uh, and I thought it was an interesting way for us to have a think about this question of the resurrection. As I said, especially as it's post-Easter. So, having read that, um, there's a theologian, philosopher, storyteller that I, uh, whose work I really appreciate. Um, uh, his name is Peter Rowlands, and one of the books he's got is um, called The Orthodox Heretic and Other Stories. Other Stories? Um, and you, look, you can Google it, it's, it's online. Uh, and he tells stories that are designed to help you think. And he's taken this idea from the shorter version of Mark's Gospel, and he's asked what might that look like. So uh, I'm going to read that to you. It's really quite a short story. Um, if it helps, he, he's, he's Irish, so he's got this lovely Irish accent. I'm not going to try and do it. But, uh, you know, picture it in an Irish accent if you want to. Okay, so late that evening, a group of unknown disciples packed their few belongings and left for a distant shore, for they could not bear to stay another moment in the place where their Messiah had just been crucified. Weighed down with sorrow, they left that place never to return. Instead, they travelled a great distance in search of a land that they could call home. After months of difficult travel, they finally happened upon an isolated area that was ideal for setting up a new community. Here they found fertile ground, clean water, and a nearby forest from which to harvest material needed to build shelter. So they settled there, founding a community far from Jerusalem, a community where they vowed to keep the memory of Christ alive and live in simplicity, love and forgiveness, just as he had taught them. The members of this community lived in great solitude for over a hundred years, spending their days reflecting on the life of Jesus and attempting to remain faithful to his ways. And they did all this despite the overwhelming sorrow in their heart. But their isolation was eventually broken when, early one morning, a small band of missionaries reached the settlement. These missionaries were amazed at the community they found. What was most startling to them was that these people had no knowledge of the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, for they had left Jerusalem before his return from the dead on the third day. Without hesitation, the missionaries gathered together all the community members and recounted what had occurred after the imprisonment and crucifixion of their Lord. That evening there was a great festival in the camp as people celebrated the news of the missionaries. Yet, as the night progressed, one of the missionaries noted that the leader of the community was absent. This bothered the young man, so he set out to look for their respected elder. Eventually he found the community's leader crouched low in a small hut on the fringe of the village, praying and weeping. Why are you in such sorrow? asked the missionary in amazement. Today is a time for great celebration. It may indeed be a day for great celebration, but this was also a day of sorrow, replied the elder, who remained crouched on the floor. Since the founding of this community, we have followed the ways taught to us by Christ. We pursued his ways faithfully, even though it cost us dearly. And we remained resolute, despite the belief that death had defeated him and would one day defeat us also. The elder got to his feet and looked, at the, and looked the missionary compassionately in the eyes. Each day we have forsaken our very lives for him, because we judged him wholly worthy of the sacrifice, wholly worthy of our being. But now, following your news, I am concerned that my children and my children's children may follow him, not because of his radical life and supreme sacrifice, but selfishly because his sacrifice will ensure their personal salvation and eternal life. With this the elder turned and left the hut, making his way to the celebrations that could be heard dimly in the distance, leaving the missionary crouched on the floor. Isn't aren't storytellers wonderful people? Um, you know, that's, that's just a beautiful story. Uh, 
And it's a story that captures, uh, it's not obviously historically accurate. First thing to say, it's not grounded in history. Um, but it's grounded in a thought experiment that says, what if we didn't know of the resurrection in the way that we do, in the way that we celebrate at Easter, in the way that we, you know, we depict with the, how would we live our lives in response to Christ, knowing that it led to his death? I think that's a really important question. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. Um, uh, I think, I think part of an answer might be in those, uh, those saints who, and I use the word, the, the martyrs, the ones who, who followed Christ to their own death. Um, you know, confident in, in the rightness of what they do. I, I have this theory that it's, it's much easier to be a Christian um, when you can be sort of confident in your own physical well-being. Uh, I, I have a, you know, I'm deeply impressed uh, and uh, awed by those who, who manage to maintain their faith in the face of severe persecution. And, and I think part of the answer is in the way they live their lives. And it's, it's deeply grounded in prayer and in hope. But it's a hope of an impact rather than a hope of kind of a, a thing for themselves. So, so I think maybe that's a pathway to an answer. Um, and, I, and I guess the, the short answer is we, we, we just kind of let it sit with us and we, we let it uh, settle into us and challenge us, challenge us. Uh, so, so there's a, some thoughts. Okay. Now, the, the final set of thoughts, and uh, how long have I been going? About 20 minutes or so. Um, look, if you've got any thoughts or questions uh, that, you, that you want to throw out there, please feel free. Um, uh, is this idea, and I've come across it in a number of places, um, and it's called the cruciform pattern of life. Uh, and um, it's just, it's worth kind of having a think about. So it, it, it essentially says that in the crucifixion, there is this story of death and entombment and resurrection to a new life. And that that pattern of life rings true. That story rings true with us. Not so much because of its historicity, but rather because it echoes our own experiences. Um, and look, you might have your own experience of, of going through things. James is reminded of how much he likes the story of Thomas, how it's okay to question things. Awesome. Um, I'll come back and share a thought with you, and hopefully that'll spark more thoughts for you and James, Pete. Um, where was I before I was distracted? So, um, so, but there's this kind of experience of the resurrection in our own lives. Um, and I, it's just, it's such a powerful experience that that when we read the story of Christ, we recognize that that is the the archetype, the 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 truest version of the story that rings true for us in our own lives, having gone through some of those things. So one of the ways that people kind of enter into this is to ask ourselves the question about impact um, and, and, and the comment that I came across that really made me think about it 
and I've made reference to this in one or two other places, so I might be repeating myself, uh, is if you're watching a documentary, and um, on the documentary there was a story of a person who died and then came back to life, you might think that was really interesting. And then the documentary would end, and then you'd watch a documentary about whale songs, and you might think that was really interesting. You see, because if it's on a documentary or something like that, and it happens far away, we kind of feel separated from it. Now, we're not questioning the, the historicity of the event, but it, if it doesn't impact on us, if it doesn't insist on a transformation in our lives, then, then we just, we, we tend to kind of set it aside. Um, and so the cruciform pattern of life says that the resurrection insists that we respond uh, far more than any question of its historicity as a, an objective historical event. Its power is in its iconic message that we respond to it in a way that uh, yeah, that, that, that is more than just affirming an historical event. So, so that are, that's kind of what I wanted to, uh, my prepared no comments. Now, there was the, que the reference, if you will, to the story of Thomas. Not in, not in Mark's Gospel, which is the one we looked at. Um, and I, I like that story. I, I feel like he gets a bad rap. I'm assuming you're referring to, unless I see the 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 hand, marks in his hand and the wound, side, wound in his side. I'm not going to reveal my belly. Don't panic. Um, I'm not going to believe. I think one of the things that's interesting is that when he sees, he does believe. Um, you know, uh, whereas so many people, they they don't they don't they see but don't believe um or they believe despite evidence and, and things like that um and so I, I find that a fascinating story um particularly when we think of how much thomas is so much like so many of us and yet historically he's kind of gone down as the one who doubted faith yes um the other reason I like Thomas is because of his courage as a missionary. So having experienced the resurrection, he then uh, travels east from the middle from Israel and he ends up in India. Uh, and he in fact uh, founds many churches there and the Christian church in India, will still often trace its roots back to Thomas and its buildings are often built on the same sites that Thomas is, uh, tradition says Thomas built on. So, so there's an example of the resurrection insisting on a dramatic shift in a person's life. And so that's in a sense, that the ideal uh, story of, of, of um, the resurrection insisting uh, an, an impact on us. Um, so that's that. Now, the, the little notes that I was working from, uh, they're on Facebook. Um, previous posts, so they're just, you know, down there um, somewhere. Just, you know. Uh, or if you want to go to the website, uh, I've posted notes to all, all the rectory, rectory study groups that I've got um, there. Now, the notes work better when you've got the conversation, uh, but hey, they're all there for, for archival purposes. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? I was going to say one thing. Barbara earlier mentioned Iconic. And um, uh, 
uh, an icon is an interesting thing because it's supposed to point us to that which we cannot grasp. So, uh, um, yeah, if you think about the icon, say, on your phone or your computer, oh, thanks, Trace. Um, the icon, unless you can read code, the icon kind of connects you to something you can't really hold in your head. Um, and, and the same is true for us and the story of God who, who went through death to life. And although we might be able to use the language, that's a, that's a picture that is not something that is, in a sense, entirely graspable. Rather, the icon points us to it. And then, ideally, we become the icon for the world, which is the kind of the, the missional stuff. Uh, I think that's responded to most of the, the sort of the questions and comments that people had. Um, is there anything else? I'll give a moment. Nope. Okay. Um, so, I'll finish with, go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Try to click the finish button.